spring has sprung. Um, we're funny. here for our April 2023 HD Genetics Community Update. So, woohoo! Um, it's great to hear. It's been uh, I don't know, is it nine months now? We've uh, been rocking and rolling. So we do these these monthly updates uh, just to give the the HD community a chance to to hear progress on our end. And then uh, we have a special topic we talk about each month, which uh, this month is about testing in the gray area. So we'll get into that a little bit as we get on. But um, what do you say? Should we get get the party started, Wes? Sounds good to me. All right. Party started. Here we go. Well, uh, just real quick, if you don't know who we are, my name is BJ View. I'm the founder and president of HD Genetics. Uh, I come from a Huntington's family. My mom was diagnosed in the the mid nineties, uh, really learned about HD when she was diagnosed and have been a community advocate uh, ever since, um, being a, a fundraiser, co-founder of the Huntington's Disease Youth Organization, uh, an advocate and now founder of HD Genetics, which is um, kind of the, my passion project uh, that I've been working on for many years and had the pleasure of uh, finding Wes out there who was, uh, a genetic counselor in training and now is a genetic counselor who also had a passion for HD. So Wes, I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah, so I, I got introduced to the world of Huntington's disease uh, some years ago now, almost, I guess we're approaching a decade, uh, whenever I went to school under Dr. Jeff Carroll, who's a founder for HD Buzz, for those that are familiar with um, that site. Um, and I studied Huntington's disease in a, in a lab that essentially studies Huntington's and mouse models. And from there, got interested in genetic counseling and then pursued a, a graduate degree in genetic counseling at Johns Hopkins and the NIH, where I focused on studying genetic counseling for Huntington's disease, specifically via telehealth, which is just very crazy that BJ and I got connected and ended up uh, getting to do this, this awesome thing called HD genetics together. So Hello, and thank you for having me. Awesome. Great to have you on board, Wes. Uh, would not be possible without you. And as uh, as many of our, our HG Genetics clients have seen, like Wes is really, he's the face of HG Genetics. He's the first person you're going to hear from. He's uh, he's the person who walks you through the, the whole genetic counseling and testing process. So uh, a face that um, will continue to become more and more popular in the HD community, whether you like uh, it or not. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Um, so, so real quick, you know, there's, there's kind of two options before HG genetics that were available for people to undergo genetic testing. There was one, people could go to their local physician, which is actually a little bit of the route that I took. I'll talk about, uh, my, my genetic testing story later on. Um, you know, the, the values of a local physician are, they can sometimes be a really quick turnaround. You come in, they give blood, they Google how to do this test and, uh, results are, are provided relatively quickly. Um, sometimes you just pay for the cost of the test, which is a few hundred dollars, but, uh, but you leave sometimes not having the education and the support and the knowledge that you probably needed to undergo genetic testing. So you don't get connected to trials, you don't get connected to treatments, you don't really get connected to good care with a, a local physician. And then there's, I think it's 65 now, uh, Huntington's Disease Society of America designated centers of excellence around the country. These are teams of really HD experts. They do run the clinical trials. They do have the best care. They truly have a team that surrounds folks to make sure that they have everything they might need when it comes to treatment for Huntington's disease. Um, and, and the only negatives of, of centers though are there's only 55, 65 of them. So if you're not within a metropolitan area, sometimes there can be a long drive. Um, sometimes there can be some waits. Uh, it's, they are healthcare systems, so it's not easy to get on the calendar really quickly. And um, uh, there's just some, some opportunity that we saw to help people get the results and, and go through the process um, in a more patient centric way. And uh, really what we are is we're just another option. Um, we, we have plenty of people who come to us who then go to a center of excellence. We have plenty of people who started a center of excellence who, who come to us. And we're really just trying to make sure that everyone in the HD community has the best option for their needs when they're going through genetic testing. And who we are um, and what we offer is, I'll wait for this slide to change, is the testing services that HD Genetics has created and is now offering in all 50 states across the United States. They're, they're virtual, um, so you don't 
leave your house or you can leave your house, but you can do this all from the comfort of wherever you might want to be. Um, there are no in-person requirements. You get to speak with Wes over a, a Zoom type platform to do all your counseling sessions. Uh, all the counseling sessions before you test are offered at no cost. So at any point, if you, know, you have a conversation with, with Wes and you decide this isn't for me, you know, you're at no loss and you know, you, we're always here to help you um, or point you in a different direction if testing isn't for you at the time. Uh, a big question we get from folks is just anonymous options. They want to, to keep their name out of their medical insurance, out of their employer's hands that HDs and their family. So we have a handful of different options catered to each individual to, to remain anonymous throughout the process. Uh, there's a long history, and I think our, our March or February webinar touched on this about blood versus saliva. And uh, we use saliva kits. So you get a kit sent directly to your house. Um, it's really the, the same thing as giving blood. You know, it's DNA is what we're measuring for these CAG repeats, which we'll talk about when we talk about the gray area later. But um, just a, an easier access route for folks to get a kit in the mail versus have to travel to, to provide blood. Uh, we have financial assistance available with our partner advocacy organization, Help for HD. So if finances are a barrier, we hope to eliminate those for you. And uh, truly, as a company who's 100% focused on Huntington's disease, we pride ourselves in, in making sure and, and allowing the folks that work with us uh, the opportunity to get connected, to get educated to the best uh, specialized care after testing, to, to learn about the clinical trials that are out there, to understand all the advocacy resources that are, are available and needed to, to go through this HD journey that um, everyone has. And it's very individual for everybody. Wes, I'll pass the next slide on to you, which is just a little bit more about the HD genetics process. One sec. Click. There it is. Yep. Cool. So uh, it looks like at least it's uh, it's reflecting on my end. So yep. um, we have a we have a pretty uh, pretty uh, simple process in the sense that whenever you're interested in our services, what we typically recommend is going to our website, hdgenetics.com, and filling out our intake questionnaire or survey. Uh, from there, you'll get a text message from me about scheduling a phone call that we could talk about uh, the, the details that you submitted online, to ask a few additional questions to kind of get a clearer picture, and to schedule a video call for genetic counseling, which is typically about a week after this phone call. Um, from there, we talk about things in, in more depth. So, you know, the implications of undergoing Huntington's disease testing and you know, how, how you might, uh, how your life might be affected by receiving a positive result, a negative result, or even one of these gray area results that we're talking about today. We talk about the logistics of testing. So like having the actual saliva kit, what that looks like. From there, we'll have uh, results appointments, one of which where we share your results with you. Another a week later where we kind of ask if any questions have come up, if you have any thoughts or have had any conversations with family that you want to talk about, things like that. And then from there, it's really individualized follow up. Follow up. So do you want to hear from us in, you know, a, a couple of weeks, uh, in a month, in a couple of months, what's best for you? And that's kind of our general uh, undertaking for, for uh, helping you out. Yeah, the, the only thing I'll add to is just, it, it, it varies on the timing. You know, some people want to make this a really lengthy process and some people have thought about it for many years and they really want the results as fast as possible on, on average. And, and typically, um, you know, about how long it takes is about a month from the time you reach out to us filling out an intake survey until you get your results. Um, it can probably be a little quicker. Um, and on, but on average, it's about a, a month for each individual. Just there's a lot of variables in there. Wes, do you want to just talk, I'll, I'll let you do the next two slides. Just talk about just real quick, the team and yep. how we use um, the physicians involved. Yeah, absolutely. So as you can see, here's, here's some representations of BJ and myself, who we've already introduced and we're happy to say hello again. But we also have a couple of uh, consulting neurologists that we work with, Dr. Jamie Hatcher-Martin and Dr. Bridget uh, Rolf, both of, both of whom oversee ordering testing in states that require a physician to essentially sign off, that a genetic counselor can't order the testing directly uh, in those states. Um, 
And we also have a wonderful board of advisors uh, that are involved in the HD space and genetic counseling space, uh, sort of all all, all around in their individual ways. Dr. Jody, uh, Corey Bloom from UC San Diego, Ellen Matlock from uh, My Gene Council, uh, Michael Berman, Dr. Martha Nance and Arvin uh, Street Aaron that all have their own individual uh, involvement with Huntington's disease as well. And, and then you wanna give this one too, just an update on kind of, uh, you know, we started in August and, and here we are. So here's just some numbers of showing you the amount of people who have reached out to us, which is a, a slide we're pretty excited about. Yeah, we're, we're really excited. I mean, as you can see, there's been some really great growth with HD genetics from, from the get-go. So we started in August. We, you know, uh, kind of grew a little bit in September and then October. And then right around the time of the holidays, we started seeing a lot more people coming in. So November, December, and then January especially. And since then, we've been seeing a pretty steady uh, in, uh, influx of people reaching out to us that are interested um, in talking about Huntington's disease, talking about testing for Huntington's disease, and so on. So just um, in this past month, for example, we've had uh, 28 folks that have reached out uh, to pursue counseling, uh, 18 of which who pursued uh, testing, went forward with testing, and we've given results to 15 people in that past, this past month. Awesome. Yeah, I think the biggest, you know, eye opener to me is that I, I think today, as of April 19th, 2023, you know, we've had just around 175 people who have filled out an intake survey, which is kind of our start of the process. But, yeah. um, you know, it, it's it's actually a, a larger amount, maybe maybe 15, 20 percent less. I'm not sure that exact number who don't go through with the whole testing process. Right. Like they. Mm -hmm. They're investigating. They have a conversation with Wes. Um, maybe personal reasons. Maybe uh, uh, they have an event coming up. Um, but not everybody pursues testing right away, and, and that's 100% okay. It's mm -hmm. uh, it's truly why we offer our counseling services at no cost um, uh, before you want to test. So if you ever just want to have a conversation with Wes or myself. Uh, we're happy to have that conversation with you and try to just steer you in the right direction. You know, mm -hmm. as I mentioned, some people start the process with us and they, they go a different route. Um, they're, you know, an appointment opened up at a center or, you know, they, they postpone it six months. So um, you know, there's, there's just a, a lot of variability in every different person, but we try to be very open to just having conversations and talking through that with, you know, Wes, a professional genetic counselor. Mm -hmm. One of the things I'm excited about, and we keep teasing this out here on slides and we haven't, you know, fully uh, brought this to life, but we want to be able to help people beyond testing. And this is, this is a service we, we, we want to offer, not just for people who come through the genetic testing and counseling process with HD genetics, but, but people in general from the HD community, you know, there, there's this kind of time where sometimes you, you get your results, but you don't have symptoms and you aren't really sure where to go. And we want to try to meet these folks where they're at to make sure that they are fully aware of what's happening, you know, what is new, where they don't have to do all the reading and, and focus on every different press release from every different pharmaceutical company that's coming out. We can kind of, I think how we're, we're looking to phrase it is let us live HD, like you live your life. We'll tell you when, when something is available for you and, and how to how to get access to what those might be. So we're building this, this navigator program out. It's not set in stone. Uh, there still needs to, to be a lot of um, kind of market research with the community to understand how we can best offer this service. But something we feel very passionate about with HG Genetics and what we have heard slowly from the community is like, help me. I've tested. Great. But like, what's next for me? And uh, there seems to be a, a bridge that needs to be built before people are truly going to, you know, a center of excellence for care. Um, as, as right now, there's there's just not, you know, a, a care need for, for many folks who don't yet have symptoms. So more to come. And if you have any feedback or, or thoughts on that for, for our team, we are more than open to it. And then our, our kind of fun topic for the day is testing in the gray area. So Wes is going to kick it off with just a couple slides talking about the gray area. I, I think I started referring to this as, you know, I was taught and I think a lot of people are taught that, you know, HD is a coin flip. 
and you're either heads or your tails, you either have HD or you don't have HD. And, you know, coming to that realization, it's, it's really a, a bad example. I think it's a good example. If you're talking to your friend on the street who you're just kind of trying to describe Huntington's to, but if you're at risk or you're in an HD family, you need to truly understand that that quarter you're flipping isn't a quarter. It's like, I describe it as a thicker quarter that can actually land on its side. And what the heck does it mean when it lands on its side versus head to tails? And um, it's, uh, it's a thing I, I think there's still a lot of confusion with in the community. So hoping we can provide a little education today on the gray area. I'm happy to, to, to share my experience as someone who has tested in the gray area and kind of how that's impacted me you know, personally and emotionally. Um, but Wes, why don't you kick it off with kind of giving us the, the genetic education of you know, the CAG repeat that we're looking for in this test and kind of where the gray area fits. Yeah, thanks, BJ. So yeah, essentially exactly how BJ just explained, this testing for Huntington's disease is often thought to be as if there's testing for this yes or no answer to the question of will I develop Huntington's disease? And the the kind of quick and dirty of, of explaining the genetics of HD without getting too deep into it is that there's going to be a genetic test that's looking for something specific called a CAG repeat count number. And there's actually gonna be two of these CAG repeat count numbers. Um, one is gonna represent the Huntington gene inherited from the individual or from that individual that's seeking testing, their biological father. And another CAG repeat count number that's gonna uh, represent the other inherited copy from their biological mother. Um, and when both of these CAG repeat count numbers are found to be below 27. So in other words, 26 or fewer, then that's what we consider to be a normal or negative test result. So an individual is not at risk for Huntington's disease and their children would not be at risk for Huntington's disease. Now, if one of those CAG repeat count numbers was 40 or more, so 40, 41, 42 or higher, then that's what we would consider a pathogenic or positive test result. Specifically, we refer to this as fully penetrant Huntington's disease. That individual would develop symptoms of Huntington's disease as long as they live long enough to, and their children would each be at a 50-50 risk of inheriting that copy of the gene that causes Huntington's disease. And then um, uh, I guess, BJ, if you could go to the next slide. So testing in the gray area, this is our, our specific focus for today. And this is what BJ was talking about with that kind of wider quarter, like a, a kind of thicker quarter that has a possibility of landing on its side. So the test actually has more possible outcomes than this yes or no. Um, and in fact, these results are, are rare, but they are possible. So if the CAG repeat falls somewhere between 27 to 39, this is what we kind of consider conversationally a gray area meaning an individual may or may not develop symptoms of Huntington's disease. We can't really be entirely sure. Um, this gets a little bit more complicated in that this gray area is divided into two kind of smaller categories. First, from 36 to 39 is what we call reduced penetrance, meaning if someone develops symptoms of Huntington's disease, first, we don't know, again, whether they will or won't, but if they do develop symptoms of Huntington's disease, it's more likely that it'll be later in life and or potentially less severe. This is considered what we call a pathogenic or disease causing result from 36 to 39. Now, if this is uh, 27 to 35, this is what we call a intermediate or mutable normal result, meaning that it's extremely unlikely that an individual will develop Huntington's disease. However, there has been some research out there that has shown that some folks show some symptoms that may be associated with Huntington's disease. And these individuals have this, this uh, copy of the gene that has um, a CAG repeat in that category. However, this is not considered a pathogenic result technically. So kind of complicated, but either way. Any CAG above 26 is unstable. It's what we consider unstable. Um, and this is at risk for expansion when past the children. And the longer it is, or the higher that, CAG repeat count number, the more unstable it becomes, the higher the risk of Huntington's disease in a subsequent generation. 
This is mostly a concern whenever it's passed from a father. So if a father has a copy of the gene in the gray area or, you know, a, an expanded CAG repeat count number, then there's a higher risk of Huntington's disease or a higher risk of this growing larger when passed to a child. And this phenomenon is called anticipation if you're looking at the scientific literature or doing your own kind of reading up on this. Awesome. Wes, the only thing, I, I don't think we've ever talked about this, but just thinking of some questions to ask you is, you know, do, do we know what percent land in the gray area? Like, let's say a hundred people tested, like, do, have you seen any data or, or you know, like, because everyone even either plans for the 40 yeah. or the, the lower, but is there a, a percentage you have any opinion on of like what percent actually land in this gray zone? That's a really great question. Um, I don't have a direct answer for you or a number that I would quote. Um, I, I would say that the, the vast majority, you're going to you're gonna get a clear response. You're going to see that you are either inheriting this copy that's going to cause HD or not. Um, these gray area results, these kind of intermediate or reduced penetrance um, copies of the gene are more common whenever there there is actually existence of this kind of gray area already in the family. Um, and so... I would, yeah, without without just uh, posting a bunch of uh, responses that don't have any substance, I'll just say <laughs> rare, but possible. Yeah, I, I knew you didn't have that answer. It just kind of occurred to me. I, I wonder if that's another question we can start to try to ask some some researchers is yeah. what percentage, you know, I'm thinking of the folks that we've we've dealt with at, at HG Genetics. I mean, we, we have had plenty in the gray area. Um, yeah. And, and again, as, as I'll allude to on the next slide, as someone who's personally in the gray area, I, I'm just kind of curious myself. I, I'm, yeah. I'm taking a stab that it might be five to five-ish percent with probably some variance there, but that is not a fact whatsoever with uh, any scientific um, study behind it. So, um, yeah. but but I do think it's a, it's a, um, you know, we, we try to prepare people for a positive, negative, and a gray, but I don't think anyone really mentally prepares for the gray. I think when it hits them, they're still a little yeah. surprised and confused. Yeah, it can be especially frustrating to receive this result when you've been spending so much time trying to decide whether or not to take this test to know one way or the other and to get a result that says, well, we still don't know one way or the other. Yeah, and, and again, by personal opinion, like I think it's, a, it's still a good, like um, it's a good area to be in. Um, but it's, it's a, it's a confusing space. Um, yeah. so I, I think a lot of people, if you were to post this in one of the, the HD Facebook groups, you would get a lot of different opinions on people saying, you know, you should be grateful you're in the gray area. And then some people who say I'm in the gray area and I'm, I, you know, I'm still struggling. So, mm -hmm. um, I think it's very inclusive. I think there's still a lot of research that we, we could be doing, um, not HD genetics, but in, in partnership with some with some researchers to understand more uh, about mm -hmm. the gray area. So, um, yeah. I guess I'll jump to, to this slide. I'm controlling the slides and, and I'm the next slide. So let's go here. Um, I, I just wanted to share my own experience. Um, you know, I, I try to do this when appropriate with folks who that we work with uh, at HD Genetics. Uh, but you heard a little bit, you know, my mom at HD uh, learned when I was really young, we were, we were, you know, very, uh, very involved in the HD community. I tested in 2010 um, when I was living in Chicago, just out of college. I think I was 23 at the time. Uh, I, I went the route of a primary care physician. So kind of the route I tell people never to take and almost the route um, of why we created HD Genetics. Um, it worked for me at the time. You know, I had 15 years of education and advocacy involvement. Um, but I, I wouldn't encourage anyone else to go through that. I, I do wish I would have had some more knowledge uh, before I got my result, but my, my CAG was a 31. So I'm in kind of this, you know, you won't get HD, but there is still some risk to your children. And at the time being 23, I wasn't married, um, wasn't in a relationship. Like I, I didn't even care what that meant. Like that wasn't in my, my future thinking. Um, but obviously now uh, I have a family. This is them on the on the right. Actually, at a Help for HD event in Nashville, um, uh, Harlan is my stepdaughter, so she had no risk of HD. But Jet, who's now three, you might even hear him in the background of this webinar. 
Um, you know, we knew going in to, to wanting to have a child that, you know, there was a, a small risk. And I, I think there is some papers that say it's, you know, the low percentage um, uh, of passing on the gene and, and mutating uh, a higher CAG into my son. And uh, there's plenty of options available for people who just want to make sure that that um, percentage is zero. Uh, we had a you know relatively lengthy discussion, my wife Jamie and I, to just take the risk um, and, and go with the odds and, and go with the the hope of science and the future will improve if we ever need it. Um, but it wasn't an easy decision. It's still something that kind of weighs on me. Like it's not a 100% certain, um, you know, there's no HD in, in my son's life. So definitely something that still sits with me today. Um, I don't worry about it. I don't have anxiety about it, but definitely something I, I think about. It doesn't help. I run a company with about genetic testing. So I think about it every day. Um, Another thing that was was tough in the the gray zone is I, I just don't think a lot of people know about the the gray area. So even when my my sister was was going through testing, I think the center she used asked what my repeat was, and uh, the, the genetic counselor made a comment like, "Oh wow, that's a strange result," and that got back to me, and that made me worry. Like, is that my result? Like is it wrong? Like, cause should I test again? And I think we hear that from a lot of folks, like how, what is the, the validity of this test? Is it hundred percent sure? Um, one of the things I, I did do that I confirmed was participation in observational studies, like enroll HD. Um, they do run a genetic test themselves. And they said that if, you know, their CAG run was way out of whack versus what I told them mine was, they would actually tell me um, and they didn't tell me. So, uh, it, it was a little bit of a relief on that end there. Cause I did have kind of some emotional struggles of, you know, like it wasn't the wrong test. Like did that genetic counselor know something that I didn't? Um, and then I, I think there's, there's still a little bit of emotion to me, even though I, I do live my life, like I will never get HD. Um, but I know there's outliers out there. So there's always that, that day or that point in time where I have a self doubt or something. Um, it's just not, uh, you're not in that hundred percent clear zone, but I do think, you know, being in the gray area and, and having a CAG of 31 is a place I'm happy to be. Um, I'm not stressed about it. I'm not worried about it. I'm not thinking about it day to day. I think there are moments in time, I guess, where I, where I think about it, but, um, the only way we can change that is to know more. So for, for folks who are in the gray area, I'd highly encourage you all to participate in, in observational studies. There's big ones like enroll HD or prevent HD. Um, you know, it's very easy to participate. You're, you're not just kind of helping yourself, but you're helping the HD community. And uh, we'll continue to learn more with, uh, with folks who participate. So um, kind of a ramble, Wes, but happy to answer any questions you, you think folks might have um, just in, in my personal experience. Yeah, I think, you know, often, often what we kind of get as, as um, uh, is it, almost like a sense of surprise uh, of sort of like, um, oh, I, you know, have been, I've known that there's a possibility that I could get it or that I couldn't get it. Um, but if I do get this result, what does that mean for me? Like, what could my next step be? Is there anything that so maybe I'm not at risk or maybe I'm at a low risk and, and that's something that I'll just kind of keep in mind, I guess, but what can I do? Can I do anything? Is there anything that I do next? Like what would you offer for those folks? Yeah, I, I think it goes back to my final statement is, is get involved. Um, we need more folks who have this kind of gray area result to participate so we can learn more. I think there's so much more, we can learn. We've already learned a lot, um, but we, we have so much more to learn about Huntington's disease. Um, and, and I think the gray area kind of gets put on the back burner and, and it makes sense to me. If we're going to learn about HD, let's, let's learn more about folks who we know 100% are going to get symptoms one day so we can help them first. But, you know, it, it doesn't mean we can't still learn about folks in the gray area, but it's probably not a priority. It's kind of a little bit more secondary. Um, so if you are in this gray area, um, just get involved. The, the enroll studies and the observational studies out there are 
pretty seamless to participate in. Um, happy to always connect with anyone who's interested and try to connect you to a site to understand how you actually go about signing up. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I think that's my 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 best um, my best advice beyond just you know uh, again I, I do personally feel like the gray area even though it's it's gray and fuzzy and not too clear it's still a, a good place to be and it shouldn't be a place where you're having daily worries it's a place where you can go and um, you know uh, do what you got to do yeah. Really good. This isn't so much a question as it is a comment that I think that someone has found very helpful in the past um, when hearing your story, BJ, which was that, you know, there is this uncertainty that's associated with the gray area that, you know, maybe, maybe not with uh, potentially developing symptoms. It's very unlikely, but it's possible and so on. Um, and the, the individual uh, really thought it was helpful to hear that BJ has been in front of numerous, numerous Huntington's disease experts and shared his story and talked about his CAG repeat count number and the fact that he has had a son um, who may, you know, also have inherited this copy of the gene that BJ carries. And no one has, you know, blinked an eye or thought that this is uh, particularly concerning. That, so, you know, as to to BJ's point of this sort of being, um, you know, getting these results and trying to trying to see this as a good thing rather than kind of leaning into the uncertainty of symptoms and whether or not you develop s symptoms. That's just sort of my offering of that that tidbit of knowledge uh, in case that's helpful for anyone out there that maybe also has a, a result in the gray area or is concerned about receiving a result in the gray area. Good point, Wes. Yeah, I, I think specifically we're at a Nashville symposium with uh, many key clinicians um, in, in a lot of specialties who focus on Huntington's. And I, I wanted to bring that up. You know, I specifically had a picture and I said, you know, I treat myself as as I'm gene negative, like I'm never going to get HD. And I, I had a son and here's what I think the risk is. And if you know anything, let me know if you know anything different. And, and I did not get any response from folks. So maybe they weren't paying attention to to what I was saying. Um yeah. Or, uh, or maybe there, that is truly the best knowledge that, that we have today, but, um, yeah, yeah good point. Um, yeah, I, I think the last thing I'll say is this is all just my opinion. You know, this is my, my N of one, like, um, trying to kind of take my HD genetics hat and just kind of, uh, free flow my thoughts. These weren't like scripted notes or anything. This is just uh, my opinion and, and how we go about it. So if you have any other questions about, Know, the gray area um hd genetics is is here to to talk with you um i'm here to talk with you wes is here to talk with you if you want to connect with us we have some options uh number one there's a michigan hdsa chapter education day and wes is going to be there he's going to be talking he's going to be have a table uh so that is um i think it's may 13th wes just outside that sounds right yeah um everyone likely knows there's the large HDSA national convention happening June one through three in New Orleans. Wes and I will be there um, in our full New Orleans uh, get up. Um, we'll have a table. Uh, you can find us. You can schedule time to meet with us. You can just learn about the HD genetics process. So we look forward to seeing many folks in New Orleans. Uh, if you want to connect with us virtually outside of like, hey, I don't even want to start the process. We have a couple options. One is we have a monthly virtual meetup. We just held our first one uh, on April 5th. So the next one will actually be on May 3rd. Uh, we may use this DocsyMe platform or we may use Zoom. Essentially what, um, what the meetup is meant to do is, you know, Wes and I are on there. It's in partnership with HD Reach. So HD Reach uh, social worker Erica joins. And it's just meant to be a place where you can join if it's anonymously or using your, your real name ask questions. We want to connect others and have it be a little bit of a peer to peer session as well. Um, and then if you, you can ever join at that certain time, we do have a private Facebook group. So you can go on Facebook and search Huntington's disease genetic testing. This is specifically a group meant to, again, connect peers and ask questions and get opinions outside of Wes and I's about the testing process. So it's a moderated forum. And, um, you know, I think you just have to answer a couple questions to, uh, to join and um, we'd love to have you a part of that group. 
Uh, we'll be having more of these monthly webinars. So we've done a couple this year. We just did saliva versus blood. This was testing in the gray area. Next uh, next month, we're going to talk about sharing de-identified data and what that means and how we're using it at HD Genetics to, to help accelerate research. Uh, June 8th, we'll talk right after the HD convention about HD advocacy resources. And then in July, um, how to participate in research. These are all virtual webinars. Uh, we had a handful of community conversations. So Wes and I were out in different areas across the country, kind of offering folks the chance to, to grab a cup of coffee with us. Um, we don't have any more on the books right now, but if you want us to, to come to you, uh, we'd love to figure it out in our schedule and, um, and just meet up in person and try to have a, a group discussion. So, and then lastly, if you want to follow us on any of the platforms, we're on, uh, you know, the Instagram, the Facebooks, the, the YouTubes, the Twitters, um, no TikTok yet, but, uh, you can also always reach out to Wes or myself at any point in time. Here's our contact information. Um, there's a, a, a direct line uh, to text Wes if you have questions. You can also call her. And uh, we're, just, we're just here to help in any capacity. So please feel free to reach out. We look forward to hearing from you. We look forward to meeting many of you at, at many of these in-person in meetings coming up. And um, beyond that, hope you enjoyed. Wes, thanks for your time and expertise. And uh, from there, have a great day. Yeah. All right, I'm going to stop the recording.